Hey, it's Joe West from the West Barn with Mike Chimshack. And today we have JJ Boogie from Arrested Development on the pod. Hey, hey. Welcome, yeah. my friend. Thank you. It's great to be here. Man, it's so cool. We were just talking a little bit off air about how it is that um, I feel like I've been knowing you forever, but it, the reality is we're Facebook friends and we've maybe reached out and messaged one each, each other, you know, over different things over the years. But it's funny, you know, I'll have people come up and just because you have like, like I think the limit's 5,000. So I got like 5,000 Facebook friends. Some will come up to a show afterwards and say to me, hey, man, good to see you. And like the talk. And I'm like, where do I know this guy from? Because <laughs> as a musician, you're trying to like not identify that you don't know the person. Right, right. And then they say, oh, yeah, we're Facebook friends. And it's right. <laughs> <laughs> then you feel like they've had their way with you. You know, that they, they've crossed a line and then anger pours out. And you're <laughs> 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 but not the case with you. Uh, so. Big fan of Arrested Development, of course. Um, and I was just doing some reading this morning about some of the, listening to some of the songs, which were like, come on. Those were like song for me, like songs of the year that year, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then to be a part of such a big thing like that, but also uh, a very accomplished producer, guitar player, of course, in the band, but... Um, you're making the records now for Arrested Development, yes? Uh, some, yeah. Yeah, I do some of the production and um, I mix and master some of the stuff. So it just depends on, uh, it really depends on the track. You know, sometimes Speech will get, get track. He's working with a producer right now that did a bunch of stuff with Public Enemy. And so he's, he's working with him as well and me. So it's just, we're all kind of coming together on stuff. So, but yeah, I do a lot of, you know, recording some of the female vocalists and, and the other rapper in the group. And Speech has his studio down in Fayetteville, Georgia, which is south, like, you know, 35, 40 minutes. And you're in Atlanta. Yeah, just outside Atlanta, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've been watching, I'm sorry, Mikey, go ahead. I was going to say, how you guys been dealing with the uh, whole COVID thing, you know? Is it uh, a big, big, big hurt. Us, you know, we were supposed to be, uh, well, our, you know, our, at the end of February, February 29th was our last show before everything uh, shut down. And it was in, we were in Vegas. And um, as soon as I got back at the beginning of March, actually, I was sick all of March. So I still haven't went and got tested. So it might have just been a regular little old cold, you know, but um but it is kind of freaky that everything you know happened then. But then the next week we were supposed to go to Dubai. That was canceled. And uh, those Dubai gigs are always like good, good money. And then um, we were supposed to be in, in Europe for a month doing like, you know, 20 something shows. But usually when we go over there, we pound them out night after night, have a day off, you know, and then night after night after night, and then a little day off, you know, and, so it's it's been it's been crazy. It's been great in one sense because I'm spending a lot of time with my family, and this is great. We homeschool our kids, my wife and I. My wife's a professional musician as well. We're working on her record right now, and um, but uh, but we're all we're all going nuts. And I mean, I thank God for some of the local uh, venues outside of Atlanta, uh, north of Atlanta, and, and stuff, who had started having live music again because even though it's it's chump change of a gig it's man it's spiritually needed yeah. to go out and play it makes me so much more grateful for you know just playing my acoustic in front of a few folks man i like yes you've been spending a lot of time in the studio during this time yeah yeah i did a couple of remixes for speech on, on his new solo record um, I did uh, the score for a, a documentary called The Monopoly on Violence um, that uh, really was released just as all the writing started, which was kind of perfect timing. So, uh, and that was my first time doing musical score. You know, I've always, something I always wanted to do. And I, and so I did that. So I've had a, you know, I've done some jingle commercial, uh, not commercials, but well, commercial music, but some uh, intro and outro music for some friends podcasts, you know, just anything I can to to stay focused on being creative and that's do interesting. What I do, so. It's crazy that you know you go from playing like Dubai to like playing a little place 
up the road. You know, it goes to show you what it really is. When someone takes away your livelihood or the music, that is why you started off in the beginning. You end up like realizing real quick, like, oh, I'm still desperate to do it, which is a great, it's great. If you didn't do that, you know, maybe it wouldn't be such a, you wouldn't be so, so successful at it. Uh, real quick, fill, help me fill in some of the holes here. But Arrested Development won, has won at least two Grammys that I was able to see. Uh, yes. The first record, three years, five months, and two days. is over four million platinum sales in the United States, uh, followed by multiple records that all charted all across the world. So not just a U.S. thing. Right. A big seminal band. When, tell me how, how that started for you. Uh, I met Speech uh, four years after Arrested Development broke up. Um, they broke up in 94. Um, so they were they had all that success in a v- relatively short period of time. They were only together for a few years. Uh, broke up in 94. Uh, Speech released a solo record in 96. Um, and uh, he blew up in Asia. Because he he was down out depressed the whole thing because of you know he was on top of the world with the band and then everything fell apart um, and then he gets a call from his manager he's like hey your record's like blowing up over there and he's like really so they started he started going over there and uh, so I met him in '98 um, uh, at a church a church I was going to had a, a arts a ministry for artists and entertainers which was really cool it was you know something co- totally different and. Um, so, uh, I used to play, I'd play in the church band because I, I was, you know, playing in blues bands and stuff. Uh, my main instrument was drums at first. I just toyed around on guitar. Um, and then speech started having me come into the studio to record drums and guitar parts on his solo records. And then, um, uh, one day, uh, at church, I was playing this like African riff, uh, guitar riff that I had kind of ripped off from somebody and I was trying to, you know, mimic it. He was like, wait, what is that? I was like, it's just this African thing that I was trying to emulate from this other guitar player. And he's like, man, let's, 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 I want to use that in the studio, you know? And I'm like, okay. So he has, has me come down to tree sound uh, studio oh, and all the band is in there and, and I'm intimidated, you know, cause it's like Zay Williams on bass, you know, and Omar Phillips on drums. And I'm like, man, I'm just like, you know, so I bring in my, at the time I had this super reverb and I'm like, you know, wheeling <laughs> trying to carry it in and it's all heavy and and I start playing the riff and I and uh, Zay's like man you have an idea for a bass bass line I'm like yeah so I'm like you know but do 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 but do 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 you know so I'm like so I tell them like man try something like this so and then they write a song with it it comes out on their reunion album in Japan and uh uh next couple of years I'm doing the same thing just kind of I'm giving his kids guitar lessons and drum lessons and in uh, 2005, he's like, um, and all this time, you know, he was in my wedding. We're, we become best friends, speech. He was in my wife and I's wedding and, and we, you know, see each other every week. And, and uh, one day I'm at his house uh, giving his kids uh, music lessons. And he's like, hey, uh, I need a guitar player for this upcoming Japan tour. You, you want to do it? And I'm like, let me check my schedule. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but it's funny because I, then I, w- I only tinkered on guitar. I, I, I could do things by ear, but I didn't really know what I was doing. A buddy of mine was studying jazz at Georgia State, uh, and he uh, came over to my house because Speech gave me a VHS recording of some of their live shows. And because I, on drums, I could hear what the drummer, I could listen to what the drummer's doing and go, oh, I know what he's playing. But on guitar, I, I wasn't at that level, you know, yet. And so my buddy Dean, who's studying jazz at Georgia State, he comes over, I called him, he's like, man, I need help learning this show pop in the tape. So Dean hears the first song. He's like, oh, it's just, you know, so he shows me how to play the opening song and then we go to the next song. So Dean teaches me the entire show. He shows it to me and I learned it and I practiced it for a month because I still had to audition and I already knew the guys in the band from being in the studio and just being around them. So we got along as friends already. But when I went in and actually did the sh- perform the show with them, went over the set, they were like, man, you brought it. And I'm like, and it's funny because I didn't know, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know I was playing a D minor seven chord. I just played what Dean showed me, my buddy who was studying jazz. And, it, and so I started touring with them 
And we're doing, you know, festivals in front of thousands of people. And for years, I'm like, I'm a drummer. I just feel <laughs> that guitar. And, um, and I'm like, man, I need to really start taking lessons. You know, like, I need to know what I'm doing. Like, and because it got to a point where I couldn't communicate with the keyboard player or with the bass player very well. And I was, I got embarrassed, you know. So I started, like, you know, took an online Berkeley class. And I started getting with a couple jazz guys and trying to learn a little bit more. So now, uh, you know, that was in 2005 when I started touring with the band. And, and then I, you know, now I've, you know, now I've finally considered myself, oh, I'm a guitar player. <laughs> it took me a long time to, to get to that point. So what yeah. did you do, like, when it was, like, time to be on the road and say, hey, we're going to add this song to the set. And it's like they play a cassette to you for, you know, were you ever put in that position where you were about to be found out? Yeah, well, we never introduced anything in the set, like, super last minute. We would have, like, uh, two rehearsals a year, you know, like at the beginning of the year if we had, were introducing new songs. And sometimes um, uh, Speech, he's got pretty much perfect pitch when he, when he wants to give you a note. So he would be like, hey, play this note. You know, and I, I go do, I fill around. Do, 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 do. Oh, oh, here it is. Okay, it's a D or whatever. And then he'd be like, and then here's your next note. And he would give me a line. He would tell me each note. He would just sing it to me, and I'd have to find it. And then it would just be this convoluted way of me learning. And I, I felt horrible for wasting everybody's time. Everybody in rehearsals looking at me like, you know, and I'm finally I'm like, oh, it's a minor pentatonic scale, or you know, or it's a minor scale, you know. <laughs> Stuff like that, you know, it's just crazy. It's wild to me that you went from teaching his kids lessons to yeah. uh, playing in the band, then producing and mixing. And I mean, arguably the most important part of the I band. Know. Yeah. And then it's funny because years ago we got, uh, we were working on a new record because uh, I, I got thrown into the uh, mixing part in a weird way too. Uh, I bought a Pro Tools rig because my wife and I were recording music, but we went over to Ben Allen. I think his name's Ben Allen. Uh, who produced uh, Narls Barkley, uh, you know, the crazy, remember the song yeah. Crazy? So we went to his place. He was in Atlanta because uh, we were thinking about having him produce and mix some of, the, some of the songs on the new record. And I was just hanging out with Speech. He was like, man, why don't you come along? Because we're going to go hang out in the studio. And he knew I love studio stuff. And so we go in there and we talk to Ben. And Ben, you know, this is right after the, you know, Crazy came out. So his prices just went... <laughs> And unfortunately, Speech had just gone through this big lawsuit with some of the samples he used on the original record, so they froze all his royalties. Oh. So all his income from all that, those hit records, it was frozen. And so Ben gives us these astronomical quotes, uh, and Speech is like, okay, you know, in his face, he's like, yeah, okay, cool. And then we're walking out the door after a great meeting. He's like, man, I, I can't, can't do that now. I would love to use him. And I'm like, let's just... I was like, let's just mix, let's just do it ourselves. I know, you know. It can't be that tough. I know. It's exactly what I was thinking. I was like, I know producers, you know, and, you know, I knew I was friends with a guy that wrote the Pro Tools curriculum for Berkeley. And I'm like, I'll just call David, you know, I'll call David Franz over in, in LA. And, you know, and so um, literally I, I would get the sessions and I would be like, okay, how do I get this sound? I'd call up Matthew Weiss and I'd call up David. I'm like, hey, I'm trying to do this. He's like, all right, get a limiter or get this EQ. And you do, put this, you know, I had no idea what I was doing, you know? And then I would get like a kind of a static mix and I'd send it to speech and it'd be like, bro, turn the lead vocal up, turn the kick up, man, way, way up, like 5 dB, you know? And, you know, and it just started off like that. And then um, my mom, I never went to college. My mom. Uh, These are some patient dudes. <laughs> oh, my God. I was so, thank God, with all the patient people. I would not be where I'm at without all these patient people in my life. <laughs> But uh, my mom paid for these uh, mixing classes. So I got to, I, I did, I spent uh, two days with uh, Roger Nichols. Um, oh, wow. And, yeah. So that was like his, ma the master mixing course at a local studio. And then uh, Phil Tan did another one a couple months later. So I took both their classes. So uh, Phil Tan came at it, uh, the whole recording and mixing from a live band situation. Phil Tan was mixing, you know, from hip hop and R&B, which, which was what I was, you know. Well, we were a mix because AD uses live instrumentation as well as samples and, sure. and stuff. So I did that. And then I got sort of, I went to a, a Stankonia, a Outcast studio in Atlanta. They had a Pro Tools certification. So I went and did like Pro Tools 6. I got certified. <laughs> and you know yeah so that was my college you know uh 
But uh, and then I just kept mixing and mixing as much as I could. And even after songs were released, I'd go back and listen to stuff I mixed, and I still cringe. I'm like, oh god, that's. Well, that first record where Speech was telling you to turn the kick drum up five dB, was that ever released? Like your mixes from that record? Oh yeah, that was um, uh, uh, changing the narrative. Um, uh, what was the other? Gosh, so many. Uh, uh, twenty one. The 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 twenty. No twenty. The the twenty year reunion record. All, all that stuff was released, and uh, and you know, and some of those songs were top ten in Japan. You know, I remember looking at the charts for a song I mixed. I co wrote. I co wrote the song called "The World Is Changing." I wrote the chords. It was a song. The chords were from when I asked my my now wife twenty one years ago to be my girlfriend. To ask her to go steady, we went to the park, and I I wrote this song called "Face Like a Flower," and it, <laughs> and I, uh, I I the chords I never recorded it, and I I didn't even I don't even remember how it goes. But years later, I just still remember the chord progression. And I I was at Speech's studio one day, and I just started playing it, and he's like, "Man, can we use that for a song?" I'm like. Uh, I have to ask my wife first because <laughs> it was kind of her, you know, and, and I, I asked her and she was like, yeah, and it ended up being, you know, it, chart, it topped out at number nine on, on Tokyo Billboard charts. And we were, we were sandwiched in between Usher and Mariah Carey. I remember I was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so. I spent some time at Tree Studio, uh, Tree Sound rather. Yeah. I went in with a buddy of mine who is a, a big hip hop producer named Diesel. And um, we were just, we were really good friends, and he just wanted some like kind of classic songwriting type stuff. So yeah. we would we went we would go in at 10 p.m. and like <laughs> they would go to like nine in the morning. <laughs> I, man, I had one day of that, and I was like, I can't. I'm I'm wiped out, man. I'm too old for this shit. <laughs> like, so, they, I'd be sleeping on the couch at three, four in the morning. Yeah, I was like, man. But what a what a cool scene that was at tree sound man like it was so beautiful man yeah so, like mingling and like hopping on each other's records it was so cool man yeah tarp studio as well and you know was, there was a and i did do a lot of work out of those i did just a little bit and then the rest of it speech had a he well he still has it uh he's got a his private studio when i first met him he had a neve console his tape machine uh, you know, and it was beautiful. And, you know, Lenny Kravitz was like, man, you need, he told speech, get, you need to get a Neve console. You need to get, you know, so speech went out and bought all this stuff. And, and at one time he was able to hire an engineer to, to operate all that. And then I remember like uh, a year or two after I met him later, I, I go to a studio again and he's got a computer sitting on top of the Neve console. <laughs> and now he's running pro tools and he's not paying for the upkeep upkeep of the neve about one and two <laughs> no, he still has his tape machine but it's just you know now it's got like candle wax on it you know and it's just you know but uh but i remember uh he had all you know this old vintage 1176s and dbx 160 all this stuff and and he wasn't using any of that he was like using a m box and you know and i'm thinking yeah. you know and then uh i remember going through his his locker and i'm like man you got a vintage you got a neumann u87 you got this you know this c12 and he's got all these like vintage gear he wasn't using and but it, and it wasn't it was because he stopped using engineers and he was just doing everything himself so he just needed to get his ideas down fast he's like let me just grab his mic plug in and go and then i um i st i one day i i got him a signal chain i, I ran this u uh, his u87 into the co1b and you know and i'm like and i was like man I put your headphones on now listen to your voice and he's like oh wow i like that yeah you know and he just you know so it's i had to go in and kind of help him out with certain you know with some of that stuff just because you know i'm like man i want your records to sound great and all that and yeah he, he did too it's just you know he's just this artist you know he's got to get his ideas out and you know we'll fix it in the mix later you know <laughs> so what do you see as the role of the band now? I mean, it's such a socially conscious band. You know, what do you feel like the role of Arrested Development is in our current political scene? Uh, man, well, the, you know, the message of the band is the same. And Speech is still writing songs with that talks about, uh, you know, police brutality, uh, the whole nine, all the social stuff now is, you know, he's still writing about it. We're still writing and, and releasing records, you know, with, with the same thing. So, 
you know, he just did an interview with this Canadian uh, 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 radio show and they, the lady was saying that, you know, same thing. It's like, you know, your stuff is as uh, valid now and as needed now just as much as back then. You were saying that stuff then and it's even more needed now. Right, and, right. And, um, but he's, you know, he, he produced a, 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 a documentary called, uh, I hope I don't want to get your, uh, your podcast in trouble, but it's called the nigga factory. <laughs> and he goes through and talks about hip hop and, and uh, how it's being used and kind of weaponized. And, you know, and, Oh wow. That's interesting. Yeah. And then he did a documentary called 16 bars where he went into a prison for a couple of weeks and recorded music with inmates um, and talk about, you know, prison reform and, you know, He's been busy. I mean, he's been doing some amazing stuff. And, you know, over the years, we've, we've gone into, we've done um, stuff for homeless uh, uh, organizations. Uh, we performed at children's prisons, uh, outreach centers in Denver, you know, Albuquerque, New Mexico. We've gone in and still, we still do things for the community, uh, you know, all the time, you know. And, but, uh, but the problem is, is, uh, you know, the, the radio won't play our, our new stuff. You know, they'll just only play the hits. And, um, you know, we, a couple of years ago, a uh, speech uh, had a meeting with uh, Clive Davis's team. Clive wasn't there, but his team was there and he was playing them the new music. And they were like, they were like, man, we love you guys. We respect you guys, but you, you know, we would love to sign you, but we, you need, you need to dumb down your lyrics a little bit. We're selling, you know, we want to sell to, you know, speeches. He just had to turn it down. He, he could have accepted the deal and wrote some pop songs or, you know, but he didn't, you know, and, and so we're, you know, we just, we're still doing what we love to do. So and what, where our hearts at, you know, uh, you know, so I respect him for that, you know, me too. Yeah. Do you see the, the new music when you say they won't play it on radio? And I guess that's part of the whole old age, old, you know, chicken or the egg thing. Right. I'm not yeah. sure why, things get played on the radio and why they don't you know yeah, yeah. uh but you know with the internet being i don't know what the radio actually constitutes in regards to listenership like it, back in the day it was everything and now it's been slowly be, been eaten eaten away at by spotify and everything else so i don't know um at the end of the day how important it is anymore but what do you guys what how do you market a band like arrested development you know is it do you guys do things does your, do you have management? Does your management do things to push to playlists? Do they do it? Anything with, in regards to releases online? How, what does it look like being a legacy band that's yeah, we have, got new uh, material? Our manager is based out of Nashville, actually. He's from Australia, uh, but he, he lives in Nashville. He's been there for a while. What's and, his name? Uh, Joe Lamont. Okay, cool. No, Joe. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not really involved with that aspect of the of the band but i mean we've worked with publicists and you know and stuff like that um but uh, our manager is definitely over the years when we first started working with him uh he was looking at like how much we were getting paid and stuff like that he was like man you you guys are grammy winning band you won all these awards you need to be paid more and so he took steps gradual steps over the years to to get us to where we were getting paid uh, uh, what he felt like we deserved. And so, uh, so my paychecks from each show, you know, went up you know, over the years, which was awesome. But as far as promotion and stuff, uh, it's, it's pretty much, it's just online, you know, uh, with, yeah. uh, you know, is, you find a freedom in that, that radio maybe isn't something that you're even going to consider at this point. Is there a freedom to the, in creating, Oh yeah, because I mean we we could distribute you know with the internet we could distribute sure, right. stuff you know so you know people listen to you know Spotify and iTunes you know and, and all that and you know a lot of people go to YouTube to listen to music you know just to watch you know uh, so it's not you know you know I use you know radio as an example but it's uh, uh, it's not you're right it's not like the how people discover music, you know, like they used to back in the day, you know, but it's still, I mean, it's still hard because we, uh, you don't make money off of album sales anymore, you know, uh, and now nobody's making money off touring. So, you know, 
What have you been hearing? I read uh, over the weekend, I read that they're talking about touring coming back in 2022, which kind of, kind of like knocked the wind out of me when I heard it. <laughs> yeah, that, you know, when I hear stuff like that, it makes me want to punch somebody in the face. But <laughs> um, so, because <laughs> uh, me, I was willing to tour through all this mess. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm still going. I'll get on a plane. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm always cautious anyway, even before COVID. I, you know, I, if somebody was coughing around me, I would cover my mouth. I'm like, I don't want to breathe in this. I don't want to get sick because I'm on, on the road. You know, I'm shaking hands with fans after a show. I don't touch my face, you know, until I get to the dressing room and wash my hands because I've, I've gotten sick. You know, I know how people get sick, you know, it's, but I wasn't afraid of the whole COVID thing, but, um, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. What was your question? Oh, we're talking about concerts coming back in oh, coming 2022, back. Yeah. and you're thinking, okay, there's no money from the record sales. Uh, the only money we can make money is touring. We got to physically show up and play. And now they're postponing it. To, they're talking about 2022, yeah. which is like, it's if you go down and hold your breath for five seconds, you're okay. But if someone tells you you got to stand on there for five minutes, you start to panic. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's, I don't, I have no idea how I'm going to survive that. You know, uh, uh, even the past couple months, I mean, it's like, thank God for the recording Academy, the music cares, you know, help, help me get through uh, a month of more, you know, get pay, help pay a mortgage, you know, um, you know, I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't on the first record. I didn't co-write the original song. So I didn't get all that money off of the, the first record, you know. I get some royalties off the, the other records, but people aren't buying records, you know? So it's like my boss is, he, he's going, he misses the band, he misses touring, you know? And we all do, we're all going nuts. And, you know, we don't know how, we don't know how we're gonna navigate this. Everybody's, you know, uh, you know, pretty much terrified, you know? And uh, so I don't, I don't know. I don't know how I'm gonna survive, hmm. you know? I have I have family members who have been helpful. I've had friends, you know, help me out. God bless them. I'm so grateful for them. And it's humiliating because, you know, uh, Arrested Development wasn't a heavily touring band over the past. I mean, we did, you know, 60 shows, 59, 60 shows a year. We're not out there for like, you know, two years straight, you know, <laughs> touring, you know, all the time. You know, we all got families. So we go out, do our thing, come back home for a bit you know, go back out, you know, so, um, yeah, we're, uh, I feel helpless, you know, and I know a lot of people do a lot of my lot people do, do. feel helpless. So. What'd you say, Mikey? I just said a lot of people feel that way. I think it's just yeah. fine, man. You know, it's an impression. Yeah. Time. It's refreshing how honest you are about it too. It's like people feel compelled to put up a strong front and say, no, no, I'm fine. You know, it's like to say like, I'm afraid. And I don't know what's happening. You know, I was talking to me and me and um, Mike are good friends with Nier Z, session drummer in town. And Nier called me last night and I just told him, man, it's like, I don't know what it is, but I just feel like a lack, a genuine lack of purpose, you know? Yeah. And it's, I like to think that I'm a purpose driven dude. And it's like, I'm able to, I'm a doer. So it's like, I want something to do. But when you take away someone's purpose, you know, I've, I've felt like a lack of purpose over the last month, let's say, yeah. where it's like I was going on sheer wheel for a while in repetitive muscle reflex, you know, get up, do. But after a while, it's just like a perpetual machine. It dies down, right? And I've reached this point where I felt like, you know, just a genuine lack of reason to be motivated yeah. during the day. It's like, well, I could just chill here or, I can go down and find something to do at the studio or even if there's things to do, you've got such a heaviness on you that you don't know that you can bring goodness to the record. Right. So I'm going to sit down and I'm mastering a record right now out of Italy and I'm mixing a record out of Chicago. And even though I've got things on the computer to do, I don't know that I have anything to give it. There's an excitement usually when I go down and I start working and it's like, Oh, what am I getting into? What can I make? Yeah. Oh, what's this? I'm about to open something. I, it's like what it's showing up. You see the screen. It's like you're. It's like opening a present. Yeah. And now, if you don't feel like you have something to bring to it, like my songwriting, I have taken a sabbatical on because I'm legitimately uninspired about songwriting right now. I've yeah. been 
trying to figure out, okay, that's okay. Maybe it'll come back again. Yeah. But, you know, I think half of it is just being truthful. People think if you have a Grammy, you guys have two Grammys. You know, you're whenever every time I see postings, you're on some giant festival stage. Yeah. You know, I was reading the thing about you and Emilio Harris playing in front of 50,000 people with this thing. and Sydney, Australia, yeah. Yeah, and I'm like, it's really sad that we don't have any backup. We don't have any 401K. You know, the arts are supposed to be valued, but it's like, a whole subset of people, songwriters, producers, engineers, musicians, people that's touring support staff have no backup in a situation like this. And yeah. then the overwhelming despair of just like, nobody knows what's happening. It's crippling. Yeah. I went through, uh, I went a couple weeks of extreme ex inspiration and I was super, I made, I've, I feel like some of my best work has, has come out of the, the past few months, but it also, I had these extreme lows in between then where, where I, I go to, uh, you know, make something from scratch and there's like nothing, you know, nothing. you know, so, I mean, the one thing that I have been trying to do is practice guitar every day, just technical stuff. You know, I had an online lesson with Guthrie Trap. Oh, nice. Know, one of my favorite guitar players, you know, and uh, so I just been going over the video that, you know, my private video with him, you know, trying to absorb as much as I can, you know, and, but, um, but yeah, you know, I think about, you talk about, you know, musicians, you know, you, you see me in front of 50,000 people and doing all these wonderful things. We, we just, I just won this, uh, a black, black music honors awards, got my name on it. Congratulations. Nice had this it's my first time ever winning a war we were on tv we were honored there and that you know that was amazing and you know but and now it's like okay it's it's this beautiful trophy sitting on my my studio on my desk and um you know now i feel like i'm not doing anything you know and right. I, I don't i don't know how long it's gonna last and and it's scary. And sometimes, and, and, and then, you know, I have two kids. I have a nine-year-old and a, a, about soon to be seven-year-old. And I'm trying to be hopeful and, and not depressed around them. You know, I'm honest with them. You know, we talk about, you know, sometimes I'm like, hey, we got to, mom and dad got to go to work tonight. We got to make money. And, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And my son just had a birthday and he's like, you can borrow some of my money, daddy. You know, and I'm just like, oh. Thank you. I appreciate that. You know, and you know, just stuff like that, you know, yeah. just, Oh gosh. But we homeschool and, you know, so we're, we're busy, you know, we do that and then we, then we record and then we go, we'll do our local shows and, you know, and uh, get our spiritual fulfillment from <laughs> playing in front of a few people, you know, locally, you know. Hey, I was wondering if your son could lend me some bread. I'm running pretty low this month. Get him. Yeah. Keep call him out. I want to ask him. <laughs> you don't mind me ask me what is your uh, recording setup? Like, what are you using? You're a Pro Tools guy. Uh, I yeah, I use Pro Tools, uh, Ableton. Uh, I, you know, well, for my wife's record, which is more of a, an Americana thing, I, we have a band called Fire and the Knife, and uh, we're using Pro Tools. I got a, a, a Apollo Quad Eight, um, and um, so you got that slate mic back there. Yeah, um, I use that, and um, it's funny though. I, on her voice, I know it's technical, but we she likes the MD four twenty one on her vocals, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, which is funny. So we've been we've been using that. It's just she just likes that. It feels more intimate and close, and you know, we I tried to, you know the slate's great too for certain things. Uh, I've been wanting to go down to speeches and borrow some of his stuff. But uh, this is our living room. Uh, we were recording in the basement. We had a flood down there. We moved everything up here. And I started recording up here. It's got vaulted ceilings. So I'm like, oh, my God, the drums sound so much better up here. So, yeah, yeah when, you, when you do drums, are you, a, are you a programmer or do you play them? Do you have I, a play drums. Yeah, I, I play drums uh, and, you know, bass and guitar. So I've been tracking all that stuff. And then uh, uh, my drum chops have, have, are not as good as what they used to be. So... Uh, for certain things I've been, uh, or, or for certain sounds, I've been sending uh, sessions over to uh, Arrested Development's drummer, uh, Will Montgomery, who also plays bass and keys. So we, I've, been, I've been enjoying having him do stuff because uh, I wanted to get a outside um, someone else on the, on the track. I didn't want it just to be me, 
you know, because I just, uh, I wanted out outside collaboration, you know, and, 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 and energy. So, but, but still, uh, you know, I used, uh, uh, M160 on my mic, on my guitar cabs. I love the rhythm mic on them. And, um, yeah, you know, just basic setup here. You know, I got Speech's old Yamaha NS10s from his uh, crawl space, and I got some some old Tenoy Activates and a sub, and you know. But uh, for you know the hip hop stuff, yeah, I program a lot of stuff, and then I'll record the live guitar over that, or a, you know, um, and I record uh, vocals over here, um, right here in the living room. You know, yeah. the other rapper uh, One Love, he'll come over, and the some of the girls in the band will, will do all their vocals over here, and then send them out over to Speech because he, he lives down south. So sometimes he's like, "Hey, I, I want to record these parts for the song," and it's just easier for them to come to my place because it's a l less of a drive. But it's been great because he's been trusting me uh, with uh, you know producing them vocally, and uh, and then recording stuff, and I send it to him all nice and neat and. You know, got all the stacks, and I, I've been working with him so long that I kind of know what he needs and wants, you know, for the most part. Are you mixing anything outside of uh, your creative circle there? Or like yeah, you, yeah. Like you work on a lot of other records that people? Yeah, I worked, uh, worked with a band out of Italy called Super Zoo, uh, a, a rapper from uh, Ghana, uh, France, uh, a country band locally here. But yeah, I, I mix uh, uh, jazz artists uh, out of Atlanta. So I'm mixing and mastering, you know, all kinds of uh, people. It's not steady work, but, uh, but I, I, you know, I don't have like a mixing website. You know, I, I, I probably should do that because I really enjoy, you know, I, I love mixing and, and I'm not really, I don't really love mastering as much, but I do it, you know, just because I, you know, I need to make money, you know, but there, there have been times where, I was like, man, if I could get enough steady work mixing, I'm like, I wonder if I would be content with staying home and just doing this, you know, because part of me, I do love that, but I, I do love traveling as well, you know, but even though it's hard, you know, lack of sleep, you know, and lack of food sometimes, you know, you get to the next town and you have to do sound check for several hours. I'm like, man, I haven't had breakfast yet, you know, and, you know, you're uh, jet lagged. I don't sleep on overseas flights. I'm we have a 10 o'clock flight to uh, London Heathrow or the Middle East, you know, or Dubai, I'm up all night. We arrive in the morning over there and then I don't go to bed until the next night. Oh. And then I start my regular sleeping schedule. So it's, it's bananas. Oh. All right. The, tell us the story of your beard. Oh. <laughs> it did, you didn't just wake up and it was like that, like that had to be a decision. <laughs> Yeah, I always had facial hair, um, and uh, well, not always, but uh, ever since high school. Uh, my wife, uh, uh, when we first got married, she said, one day, I want you to grow your beard real long. I want it to lay on your, your chest like a king. And I, I, I thought she was joking. And uh, when I finally went full-time as a musician, she was like, hey, start growing your beard out. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I remember like... Usually, this is the exact opposite conversation from every, every other wife, by the way. <laughs> exactly. What? My wife is the opposite. So she's like, she wanted... So I grew it out for like like three weeks. And I'm like, all right, can I trim it now? She's like, oh, no, keep it going. Like six months go by. The three-month three mark was a little awkward, you know, and because it just looked like a, a bush. It wasn't hanging yet, you know. She's like, no, I love it. I love it. And I used to get compliments on it everywhere I... Everywhere I went, I was getting compliments on my beard. And uh, uh, and then it just, you know, three years later, this, this it took three years to get this long. And uh, she's like, she just thinks it's sexy. She, that's what she loves. She loves it long. Every, I've, I've trimmed it um, probably seven or eight times because it would be, it'd be down to my knees, right? I have to, you know, it gets in the way of my guitar. There have, been, there have been times where I'm in front of 50,000 people and I have it in a braid because I'm in an outdoor, I'm in an outdoor, uh, uh, like a big festival. If the wind blows, there have been times where my beard goes right up in my face and I can't see my guitar. I'm looking down like, oh, you know, so I have to braid it to weigh it down. So there was one time I, I remember I hit this long chord at the end of the song and I heard this like a sitar effect. I'm like, what is that noise? And I looked down and my braid was like laying on the guitar strings while the, the, the distortion, you know, was, you know, sustaining. 
and I was rubbing against the strings. I could hear it through the PA. And I was like, what? I'm like, oh, Jesus. You know? But there have been times where it gets caught in my hand. I'm playing, and it's caught in my hand like that. I'm like, you know. So I have to keep it, I have to keep it, you know, I have to take off an inch shirt or two. And every time I do, she's like, you just, my wife's like, you just lost an inch of your sexiness. <laughs> uh, sorry, babe. She gets mad. That's a cool woman. So, <laughs> yeah. Tell me when you wake up in the morning, is it like bedhead, but for the beard? Yes. I, I have to, bra- I braid it at night. Otherwise it would be, when I roll over, it's, it's all in my face. I mean, I, years ago I had long hair and I remember, you know, rolling over and it would be in my face and, you know, but, uh, but I, I have to braid, I braid it every night and otherwise it's like, you know, I'm always having to move it out of the way. When I go swimming with the kids, it's like, I feel like I'm being attacked by an octopus, you know, it's, it's a pain in the butt, you know, but, um, it's got its own fan base. My wife, it makes my wife happy. My kids love it. My mama doesn't like it too much, but, uh, you know, what's the negative? Is there any social negative of having a beard where you get sort of looked at? I guess. Yeah. Like, Cause I, I, everywhere I go, I, people, I could see, uh, you know, at gigs, uh, I could see a table like, you know, like, Oh, look at that guy. And they'll smile in. And sometimes I forget, Oh, it's the beard. You know, I'm like, sometimes I'm like, Oh, do I got a, a booger hanging out my nose. I'm like, Oh, ah, it's the beard. Okay. You know, but I get compliment. I mean, I have people stop me in parking lots literally like, Hey, can I get a picture with you? My, my brother's trying to grow his beard out, you know, or a girl will be like, Hey, I want to take a picture and send it to my husband, you know? And you know, I, and in Japan, I've been, I've been, my beard has been fondled by girls in Japan walking off the stage where they're like, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. they're just grabbing it. And, you know, and so, <laughs> yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> Amazing. I met, I bumped into, uh, uh, you remember uh, Duck Dynasty, the show that was on years ago? I bumped into uh, Jason. Um, one of the one of the guys from Duck Dynasty in the airport, the Atlanta airport. We were we had a gig in in Louisiana where they're from, so I went and got my picture with him. And he just looked at me before he before I said anything. He just looked at me. He's like, "Man, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that's funny. It's such an odd thing that I. It's got to be some sort of brotherhood when you see another person. It's like uh when you ride on a Harley Davidson, they always give you this." down low they'll give you like one of these like hey what's up brother yeah. and, and i've always wondered like who cares you know because i have harley and i'm riding i'm like do i ever do I have to do this every time a bike goes by <laughs> right and it's like yeah and it's, it's like funny. it just seems so silly but there's it's we combine ourselves for for such silly things and we separate ourselves for like equally stupid things right tribal it's this tribal nature but it's funny because when after i grew it out uh at my boss speech he's, he's one of my best friends i love him to death he was at one point he was like mm, maybe maybe you shouldn't have the beard for the bit maybe it's not the right look for arrested development you know because it's an afrocentric hip-hop band i'm like but i'm i mean i'm white anyway i mean i'm the odd man out you know and and he was thinking about like you know asking me to to shave it off and his daughter zoe who's a she's a, a, a actress doing some amazing things right now. And she was just like, no dad, JJ needs to keep his beard. It looks great. You know? So she stuck up for me and he was like, all right. And then now he's like, you know, he'll, he'll say things, you know, in interviews or on, on at shows, he'll joke around about the beard. So that was, wow. your, you know, when I, after I first grew it up, but yeah. So at one point he was just like, nah, I don't know, but his daughter stuck up for me. And now it's like, yeah, that's just that's just part of the. Did you tell him how much the sexiness she would lose? <laughs> exactly, my <laughs> wife would kill me. She literally. I gotta leave the band. But yeah, it's either, it's either leave the band or leave my relationship. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Tell me a little bit. You know, tell me a little bit about what what you're hoping for for the next year. It's like okay, so maybe you can't tour as much. And touring really is the heart and soul of Arrested Development, right? I mean. Yeah, yeah. What keeps it going for you guys? So I'm wondering, like, what it looks like for you. Are you going to be trying to step up in studio stuff, other project stuff, you know, intellectual yeah, property? Already, I've already, you know, already done that uh, with, um, you know, production stuff. I'm just still, you know, trying to get, you know, uh, trying to network and hustle for more, more work, you know, more jobs. Uh, uh, but and then I'm, yeah. So. I'm, I don't know, but I just don't know how to do it. You know, 
uh, yeah. cause everybody's budgets, all the musicians, but it's, it's usually like now it's like a lot of the, the people that I know, you know, it's a lot of them are, uh, aren't full-time musicians, you know, or, you know, the ones that are already using guys that they've already been using, you know, as far as you know, mixing engineers and mastering engineers, but I still get inquiries like, Hey, I want you to produce a track for me, you know, from some hip hop guys and, you know, stuff like that. But, um, uh, and then I've been working on this record with my wife. And of course I'm not, I'm not getting paid for that. We're, we're, you know, we're just, we're doing that for our, for ourselves. So we, we need to finish that. We've been working on it for several years. Actually, Joe, I hit you up about uh, producing it uh, a couple of years ago. I uh, hit you up because you were one of the guys I really wanted to work with. And it was at a time where I was putting off doing the crowdfunding thing. I didn't feel right about it, you know, for several years and all my peers were doing it. And I'm like, man, they're all make, they're making so much money. So by the time we jumped in, I think, social media was kind of uh, fatigued with that. So we didn't make nearly as much money to, you know, for this, you know, so it was enough to get some gear, some extra gear and do it on our own. So we've been working on it on our own and, you know, it's been challenging to try to produce your wife because, you know, we're, we gig together every weekend when I'm not on the road, I, we do music together, but to actually produce her vocally, it's like, Oh man, I got to figure out how to do this, you know, right. I don't have a lot of experience producing, you know, vocalists, especially one that you're, you know, have an intimate relationship with. That's why I wanted to work with somebody outside. Let, let them help us, you know, direct me on guitar and direct her, you know, and uh, pull out of us, you know, what we need, you know. What are your thoughts now on Kickstarter and other crowdfunding type things? Have you changed your opinion on it? Well, yeah. I mean, if they could be effective for people, then I'm like, you know what? Awesome. And I've seen it. I've seen them do amazing things like help people with medical bills. Uh, yeah. Well, that kind of thing. But I've seen, uh, but I've seen uh, other bands that are way bigger than what me and my wife are, you know, uh, them raising money, you know, on, on kicks, you know, my, oh my God. I, I work with a band. I feel so bad. It makes me not feel so bad asking people for money, you know. Uh, see, the, uh, it's interesting because I went through this with another band, of, of, a mutual friend of Joe and myself, uh, my buddy Brent, um, who was very against the whole idea. He, yeah. he just thought it was like the same kind of thing. I don't just I don't, was. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to ask my fans for money. But what we found, which was really interesting, obviously this is the, the premise of all of these crowdfunding things, is that the fans really want to support. They want to be involved. And you give them incentives that the only place they can get, if they're real fans, they actually love it. Yeah. It's only counterintuitive for us as musicians. Unanticipated, yeah, but they do. Unanticipated, but they love supporting. It, 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 it's a two-way street. You know, you need them, they need you. In some, and it's we, we completely changed our thoughts on Kickstarter because how much they love it. Yeah. And they get everything early. If you're a real fan and you get to hear the music before everybody else, you know, or, or you get limited edition shirts that you can't buy at the shows, you know, uh, lyric sheets, you know, handwritten lyric sheets, all, you know, all the different. I like that. It was, it was fascinating how, how much people wanted to support. Yeah. It kind of blew our minds. Same with, you know? um, when, when, uh, Georgia locked down, uh, and all our gigs were canceled. We started doing, you know, the, the online streaming thing. And, uh, and it was, it was stressful, but it was like, man, we got it still. We got, I have the gear, let's do it. And we had technical problems all the time, but, and I remember our first stream, you know, we made, I think 1750 bucks. Yeah, it's amazing. Stream, yeah. Oh, wow. Tips. People yeah. were just poured it in, you know, we didn't make that much everyone, but, <laughs> but it was like, wow. You know, it was amazing. We were crying because we couldn't believe people's generosity, you know, to, to help us. And, you know, so, uh, you know, well, I still think we should probably, me and my wife probably should do more during the week. But I have I have friends, uh, locals who, who uh, get online every day, twice a day sometimes, hustling, trying to make anything they can. And sometimes the other artists are like, man, you're overexposing yourself. Stop it. You know, and then they're just like, what else am I going to do? <laughs> you, know? Right. you know, it's like. Have you I guys on Patreon at all? We haven't done that, no. I, I don't know too much about that either. I just yeah, I have, me either. Uh, I know it's heavy. It's big in the podcasting world. I, I know several podcasters who 
rely on uh, Patreon accounts and they, you know, some of them make really good money. Um, and some of them, it's just enough to cover costs, which is fine, you know? And so, uh, but uh, we haven't, we haven't done that yet. I mean, it, it might be something worth looking into, but yeah. I don't, yeah. Well, why don't you tell us where people can find you if they want to work with you, if they want to have you play on their projects, if they want to have you produce them or mix them or master them, um, you know, anything that is JJ uh, and you want to get a hold of them, what's a good outlet? Uh, I, I think, you know, I've got a lot of work through f- just Facebook. Hit me up on Facebook or, or okay. uh, Instagram, JJ Boogie. Uh, uh, just the letters JJ Boogie. My name is Jason Reichert, R-E-I-C-H-E-R-T. So you can look me up there, but JJ Boogie with Arrested Development. You can find me on Facebook, send me a, a message and, you know, definitely would love to you know, work with anybody. Yeah. Awesome. Well, you're a good soul, man. You can tell. You can just, uh, it's a, you're easy to be around. So that translates into the studio every time, you know. Mm-hmm. And maybe, maybe one of your, um, one of your Patreon or your um, GoFundMes could be, you know, locks of beard for <laughs> right <laughs> one, one braid of beard for, you know, a million dollars. Right. There you go. Uh, I was in a band with my buddy and I said, you know, we either want to sell one of these records for a million dollars or a million of these records. Yeah. (laughs) We didn't do either. Uh, (laughs) But everybody's got to live, man. And uh, I'd love to, I'd love for people to find you. And, you know, I I believe genuinely believe that people get around other cool cats like you that just want to be involved in something really great. You could tell you want to help whatever it is that's coming across your plate. You want to be a great creative part of it. So, that really shows and it's a testament to you, man. So we appreciate having you and thanks for spending a little bit of your morning with us. Yeah. I appreciate it. It's been fun. Thank you, Thank very you much. JJ. Uh, look him up and uh, that's it this week from the West barn. We'll see you next time. <laughs>